Well, welcome everyone to our annual Global Entrepreneurship Week webinar. My name is Rob Williams. I'll be serving as today's webinar moderator. Uh, at SourceLink, you know, we believe in the power of entrepreneurs and the power of celebrating those who champion and uplift small business owners everywhere. It's why we produce this webinar every year as part of Global Entrepreneurship Week. We are exceedingly proud to play a role, and I encourage all of you to learn more about Global Entrepreneurship Week. There is still time to get involved. It's not Friday yet. Um, and you can find more information at genglobal.org backslash GEW. And my friend Cecilia may even be on the call. I think I saw her in the registration list. And so if you see her name, you can always uh, send her a note. I know that she would love to connect with you. Now on to today's webinar. This format has been designed to be conversational. I will warmly welcome input and um, uh, comments in our chat, but I am asking everyone to please stay on audio mute. I am thrilled to welcome a number of my close friends who are true international luminaries on today's topic, covering the future of entrepreneurship-led economic development and also ecosystem building. We'll start first with a quick introduction of Maria Myers. She is the founder of SourceLink and the executive director of the University of Missouri Kansas City Innovation Center. Maria has created a number of world-class technical assistance programs for entrepreneurs, developed pioneering metrics and methodologies. She wrote the book on this called Beyond Collisions. Her practices and programs have been expanded well beyond the Kansas City market. Um, and have now impacted hundreds of communities all across the country through the SourceLink National Program. We also are welcoming today Charles Ross. Charles is the president and CEO of the International Business Innovation mm -hmm. Association, commonly referred to as MBIA. Charles oversees the leading international association for incubators, co-working spaces, accelerators, and entrepreneurship centers. He has been an early champion of ecosystem building he is one of the first established groups to welcome many of us doing grassroots work to join his network. This includes um, holding convenings like the eBuilders Forum, where they specifically talk about entrepreneurship and ecosystem building, um, which actually we actually partnered with him just, uh, what was that, last month to produce um, in Kansas City. And so we're very um, fortunate to have him joining this call as well. Standing right alongside Charles, we have Andy Stoll. Andy Stoll is the founding executive director for the Ecosystem Building Leadership Network, EBLN. Um, he has been an early pioneer as well in the ecosystem building work. His work at Kaufman has been instrumental, and I mean instrumental, in getting our field to where it is today. I mean, his early, early career building ecosystems in the Midwest truly makes him especially equipped to give great insight today. And that leaves last but certainly not least Nathan Oley president and CEO of the International Economic Development Council, also commonly referred to as IEDC. Nathan's taken the helm. It's been now maybe two years, Nathan. Um, and since that time, he has greatly expanded the International Economic Development Council. He has secured multiple million dollar large grants to build and expand specifically on entrepreneurship led economic development initiatives. Um, he has been absolutely instrumental in creating and, and helping to uh, equip our field with the first uh, uh, certification of its kind with the Entrepreneurship Development Professional um, Certification. He also has a tremendous wealth of uh, experience doing rural economic development um, and economic development across the board. And so we're also fortunate to have him joining us today. So without further ado, let's dive in. My first question I want to direct to Maria and then have Maria, if you wanna go ahead and pass it to one of the other presenters on today, that would be great. But I wanna hear from you why you personally are passionate and excited about ec entrepreneurship led economic development and ecosystem building. Why am I passionate about this? Um, you know, for me, it's all about the jobs. So um, way early in my career, I think I spent a lot of time helping to lay people off. And I love the fact that entrepreneurship is where the jobs come from. Mm -hmm. And so it's really wonderful to watch people start new things and then create um, jobs for people and, and wealth and 
a, a, a movement forward. So I think that's that's where my passion is, is in helping that. And why do I love ecosystem building? Because I love looking at things as systems and really understanding how all the different parts work together and knowing that the sum of the parts is way better than the whole. And so let's um, let's make things happen by helping people work together to get the work done. I just love that kind of stuff. I love knitting things together. <laughs> so I'll give it to Charles. Great, thanks, thanks, Maria. So really looking forward uh, to uh, our discussion. And I'd say for me, um, I'm just uh, have been so um, impressed by the impact of entrepreneurship in individual lives and the lives of uh, community. Um, I think about in some of my earlier days when I was doing uh, investment in the companies and looking at the transformative impact of a company going public and what it means for not only like the CEO in terms of wealth creation, but you know, employee number, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten, all the way throughout the managerial ranks and just company ranks of companies, uh, just life changing events. And not only for some of the, you know, high scalable companies, but even for, um, you know, companies that might be lower growth companies, the um, self esteem that you get out of uh, entrepreneurship. So um, I think that really drives me. And um, in terms of like specifically ecosystem building, in order for us to be able to do um, leverage entrepreneurship for more um, faces and more places, I really think it's important that we look at how we um, arrange all of the individual parts to make entrepreneurship more effective and ecosystem building is a way to do that. So that's what excites me about that new, that movement that we're currently in. I'm going to pass it on to Andy. Great. Thanks for having me. Uh, someone is wondering where I am. Uh, I'm not on the set of Indiana Jones or in a church. I'm at a Global Entrepreneurship Week event in Rochester at the Artisan Works, which is a giant warehouse. Uh, we're having a conference, but there's uh, art and creativity all over the wall. This is actually part of my answer, uh, which is because I love the notion of creativity that you can have an idea and you can turn it into a thing and that individuals can be empowered in their communities to have an idea of whatever their thing is, whether it's a business or a piece of art and to do that. Years and years ago, uh, and Rob will know this because uh, Rob and I, and I saw Mo Collins is here on, on the, the call. Uh, we were doing ecosystem building work in Iowa before I was at Kaufman, before I was at the ecosystem building leadership. And I was doing this work on the ground in Iowa uh, with no money in the grassroots community. And uh, we started a company called CDR Studio, me and my business partner, Amanda West, because we believed in the idea that networks and communities can foster entrepreneurship. And uh, we uh, were doing super well with the double bottom line company. We were doing really well with the bottom line of social impact. We were doing terrible at making money to pay ourselves. And uh, we had the sort of a, I'll say to the long, it's common entrepreneurial story is we had our runway was out of money. And we had an event we were going to pull off and it was going to be a make or break it. And um, at the last 11th hour, a businessman in our community that how much money do you need to finish this event? And we said $5,000. And he looked at us and he said, you got it. And we said, what do you want for this? And he said, uh, nothing. I just want you to succeed. And so we took the $5,000. We turned it into an event. We built uh, our company. Uh, Mo Collins here on the call from IDC was one of our first clients. And we built a company and built uh, helped build and strengthen the ecosystem in Eastern Iowa. Later on, I went back to that guy, uh, Barry. And I said, Barry, why'd you give us that $5,000? Because Barry is answering your question, Rob. Barry said, I love what you're doing. And I said, why do you love what we're doing? He said, because you're unlocking latent entrepreneurial talent. There's so many people left out of the conversation of entrepreneurship in our community and what you're doing to build this networking community. Though we didn't see ourselves as economic developers at, at the time. We were unlocking latent talent that was in our neighbors and our friends and the people around us. So that's why I love this work. Nathan, I'm going to pass it over to you. Thanks, Andy and, and Rob. A special thanks to you for hosting this conversation and, and inviting all of us to be a part of it. For me, you know, entrepreneurship has been a part of my life and career since the very beginning, whether I was working at the state level, the federal level, working exclusively in rural and tribal places, or now in an international space. And a lot of my focus has been on how do we help communities that maybe have been left behind in the past. And to me, the opportunity has always been around entrepreneurship and, and small business growth. And how do you help drive innovation in different places? And entrepreneurship doesn't care about boundaries. It doesn't care about community size. It doesn't care about all of some of the typical things that you might think about from an economic development perspective. It really is about unleashing talent and ideas. 
And ecosystem building in particular, to me, is about connectivity. That's where I personally draw energy from. Um, and I think it's where the field itself draws energy from. And so that ability to connect, to lift one another up, uh, and to be a part of a collective effort, I think, is just a really unique aspect of ecosystem building that, that both inspires me, but I also think really directly leads to really unique uh, opportunities to drive equitable economic prosperity in places of all sizes. Now, one thing that uh, comes to my mind, I heard uh, Victor speak recently, and he was talking about a 1% increase in entrepreneurship results in, I believe, a 2% decrease in poverty at the state level. You know, it's just stuff like that. It's like, wow, this is this is incredible. It's, it's so impactful. It's so impactful. Um, Maria, may a question for you. What are some other um, data that we see when it comes to entrepreneurship and its important role in economic development in, in this ecosystem building world? I think it's proven that um, entrepreneurship builds wealth and it builds wealth in every community. And so I think you'll find that in, um, in business owners that are, um, are in African-American populations that that are non-business owners versus white business owners, you know, it's 13 times the difference in wealth. But if if you look at the business owner to business owner, it's three times the, the difference in wealth. And so there's a really good example of a proof that um, entrepreneurship can build wealth. And not only does it build wealth, but it builds um, the communities around it as well. So I think that, that that's important. You know, um, there's some data now that's showing that about 3.8% of anybody in a given location is working on starting a business. So if you just kind of look at the Kansas City um, area, if you say we have a population of about 2.5 million, you know, that equates to about 7,400 people that are working on starting a business at, at any given time, which is, is pretty strong. So work that out for your population and see, and see kind of what uh, what that looks like. And then of course we, you know, we measure the jobs um, quite a bit as well, because, you know, I'm in the jobs. And one of the things we know, for instance, in Kansas city is that in the last five years, our businesses have started more than 80,000 jobs and it equates to about 8% of the workforce. It is about 66% of the uh, new jobs in the Kansas city region. And we see that many, many places. So we keep hearing from the Coppin foundation that it is the young business, the business that is less than five years old that are creating all the jobs in their communities. And we have proof positive. That is very true. So there are just, you know, some um, top level stats on what's going on in, in entrepreneurship. A lot of people working on it and uh, it's a great way to create upward mobility and change wealth and reduce wealth gaps. And it's also um, very prevalent. <laughs> Lots of people out there doing it. I think there was a point that you had once uh, shared, might have been at eBuilders actually, that there's so much demand and need for entrepreneurs that it's almost silly that um, in some cases there's a, maybe a little bit of competition among ESOs or the providers that are providing services. There's more than enough work. <laughs> That's right. There's plenty of work to be, plenty of work to be done. So I don't think we have the number of entrepreneurial support organizations. Uh, we don't have the capacity in the ones that we have or that we have to serve everybody that's out there. So there's lots of work to be done. Hmm. Andy, did you have something to add? Because it looked like you came off mute. Sure. I was just going to ask Maria, um, you made a point once in the presentation where you were, um, you have found, you've, you've probably the master at figuring out how to count all these jobs <laughs> connected to entrepreneurs. But you were uh, contrasting that with during the period that there was the effort to try to get Amazon HQ2 to move. And you just had some thoughts on sort of how you think about efforts to, to attract Amazon HQ2 and then the entrepreneurial ecosystem and the engine of job creation. Can you, do you remember those remarks? And if so, can you sort of- yeah, Kind of, but you know, I, can, I, can, I can make something up. No, <laughs> no I, I, I mean, I do think that in, uh, in economic development, there's attraction, there's retention, and there's creation. And attracting uh, companies um, is important, just like retention and especially creation are important. And a lot of times when we're attracting companies, we're looking for that big company that's 300 people or up. And um, there, it's a promise of jobs coming to the community to, um, to build the community. And, I, and, and it's an important 
it's very important for many places to have that happen. And, you know, in the Amazon uh, crush, there were a lot of investments made in trying to bring Amazon into that particular area. But in reality, when you look at, for instance, in Kansas City, 19,000 jobs started last year by our um, by our entrepreneurs. And you contrast that with a number of promises of jobs that can come from attraction. It, it needs to be equal. It needs to be an equal thought when we think about how to build um, our communities. Let me just add a little bit of what you, I believe you also said too, which is sort of the other layer is, mm -hmm. yes, we need to attract and retain companies. And I think Amazon HQ too was like 15,000 jobs, but that's a one-time sort of investment from Amazon. But in the case of the, would you say 19,000 a year, that's actually a renewable resource because right. as more entrepreneurs come on, that entrepreneurial engine in Kansas City is creating potentially $15,000 or 15,000 jobs a year as mm -hmm. it, it's assuming we're continuing to to grow it and, and help entrepreneurs. So that renewable resource, that engine of job growth is, is the entrepreneurship or entrepreneurs. Right. And you need the supply chain, right? So you, you need to be generating um, new businesses, to, even if you want to bring a, a larger business in, you need to help create that supply chain for them as well. So it's um, it, the small business is incredibly important for building jobs in your community. That's fine. When thinking about um, kind of where the field is headed and what's next, um, Charles, I have a question for you. Uh, I know MBA does the impact index and you actually ask specifically in that index in that survey of your members and of the field, um, what's going on and, and talk about entrepreneurship ecosystems. Um, what did you find or have you found um, things that are interesting in your latest report and what does the index and some of the things that you've been hearing from your members, uh, the, sh the sharings, the learnings that they're providing to you kind of tell you about what's coming and what's next in our field? Okay, sure. Um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to share more about our uh, the data collection effort that we're, we're doing for the field. And just to kind of follow up on the discussion around some of the trends that we're seeing around, around the uh, data um, I hope we get a chance to also talk about a little bit about just the, the um, activity that we're seeing with new business starts. Um, you know, after the uh, pandemic, we were seeing kind of record levels of, of uh, registrations of new businesses. And I think that's pretty um, significant because, um, you know, this is more and more entrepreneurs that are going to be looking to engage with our ecosystem. And we know that you know, starting the business is just starting the journey. And really what we want to get these businesses to is uh, milestones where they can um, grow revenues, increase wealth, and um, to, um, to hit out outcomes for their community. Uh, but going to the impact index. So this is a, a longitudinal data uh, set that we've been collecting for uh, several years. And as, as Rob has mentioned, we're actually in the process of up, updating our data for FY23. Our uh, latest data set is, is a couple of years old. And um, kind of the purpose of this data set is in a couple of different areas. One is just to tell the story around um, entrepreneurial support. Um, um, what does it look like? What kind of impact our organizations having in their communities to uh, support entrepreneurs? But then we also look to provide data that will help uh, practitioners and entrepreneurial support and ecosystem building to, to do their jobs more um, effectively. Uh, so to be able to identify areas for program improvement, areas for uh, benchmarking, and uh, hopefully to get some uh, insights into what's going on, on in the industry and for strategic planning. So Rob, I, um, so we're still collecting data. Um, and we're going to be collecting data probably until the end of the year. So great thing about it that um, if you're doing work in this area, it's still an opportunity for you to participate, share your data um, and your impacts. But just looking at some of the preliminary data, probably the thing that um, that's most significant, one of the questions that we, we ask is um, like the importance of various goals to entrepreneurial support organizations. We'll look at goals like accelerating the local economy, job creation. Maria mentioned um, how important entrepreneurship is to jobs. We look at workforce development. 
Um, so probably like seven or eight different goals that we'll list and say, how important is this to your program? And what we've seen from like 20, 2019 to 2023 is kind of a shift in the overall importance of, I would say, some of the more traditional economic development goals for entrepreneurial support, goals like supporting the economy, job creation, and then also a goal around just um, proliferating, growing an entrepreneurial culture in your community. And we're seeing well, of a lot of like a 10 to 15% shift, more of a, a downward shift in how important those goals are, which is pretty interesting. We still need to do a little bit more um, research around just kind of what's driving that. Um, now, let me mention that these these those three goals that I just mentioned are still like significantly important to these programs. So we look at like the percentage of our uh, of the respondents that said that these goals were very important or somewhat important, and it's in the you know seventy to eighty percent range. But what we're seeing is. Um, say, for example, um, accelerating your local econo uh, economy from 2019 to 2023, it went from 90% of the respondents said either most important, very important, or somewhat important to 76%. So it's a that's a pretty significant drop. Um, and I think what this is saying to me is that, um, you know, the economic development, the traditional economic development goals are still very important, but they're not the only game in town. That um, entrepreneurship is being used as more of a tool to address not only economic issues, but social issues maybe for communities. So we're, we're very excited to like drill down into the data and see if we can get more insights. That's, that's very helpful. Um, I wanna kind of build on that and Actually, Nathan, I'd like for you to go next because you have been a tour de force when it's come to proactive outreach and engagement of stakeholders at every level, including you know, obviously the membership. Um, and as part of that, you have the entire strategic planning exercise, extremely comprehensive. Um, I think you received feedback from over 900 economic developers in the world. Um, you too gathered a lot of insights, uh, a lot of um, data, and you know, given that process and all those conversations that you have had and your team have had, um, what have been some of the trends and, and, and things that you're seeing emerge from where you sit? Well, it's been a fascinating two and a half years in this role, but I want to recognize that this conversation with an IDC started way before I was in this role, and uh, special thanks to Maria. Uh, and a number of others that are on this call who really helped IDC think about how do we start to bridge that gap that might have existed between traditional economic development and, and entrepreneurship and ecosystem building. And so part of what I brought to the organization was a real desire to make sure feedback was a part of every decision that we made. And obviously, that was a huge part of our strategic planning process. We engaged more than 900 folks, not just members of IDC, but folks that had never been members or maybe didn't even know that much about IDC to make sure that we had feedback in this process from a wide variety of perspectives, experiences, uh, and, and you know from folks across the world, quite frankly. What came out of that was a growing recognition that the field of economic development is not only changing, it's transforming right underneath our feet. It, it, obviously, that was accelerated by the pandemic and the opportunity to build out programming within IDC, specifically around entrepreneurship, really stemmed from those initial conversations with Maria and a number of others that were leaders in the field that helped us to actually put together a brand new certification. So IDC does a lot of work in professional development. We have uh, a more traditional economic development certification called the Certified Economic Developer, but uh, a little under four, four and a half years ago, the conversation started about creating a certification specific to entrepreneurship led economic development. And because of partners on this call and, and many others in the field, IDC created the second ever certification for the organization. And I can't stress how big of a deal that is, not just for IDC, but for the field of economic development to recognize and lift up entrepreneurship led economic development as a really key component of the work that economic developers do that ecosystem builders are doing. Uh, 
In that short amount of time, just the last few years, we've had more than, than a thousand courses on entrepreneurship led economic development taken. We've had 67 people complete the certification process, which is no small feat in that short amount of time. But most importantly, we've started to engage because of that strategic plan with a whole host of other partners. Charles and, and, and I have spent time with our teams actually convening folks from both of our organizations together to talk about how we can better collaborate, what's happening on the ground, and how do we build opportunities to connect one another on the ground in the work that's happening. Obviously, Maria has played a, a really strong and deep role in the history of not just the EDP, but of, of IDC recognizing entrepreneurship led economic development as a key and critical aspect of this. Andy not only helped to fund some of this work while he was at Kaufman, but he's been such a key contributor and partner as he starts at EVLN. And to me, that those partnerships are what makes this work special. And our strategic plan was very specific, that everything we do, every decision we make is going to be done with stakeholder engagement, with feedback, and it's going to be done in collaboration with others. Because we know we can certainly do a lot to move the field forward, but we can't do it alone. And so doing it with partners, making sure that all of you are a part of crafting not just what EDP is today, but what entrepreneurship led economic development looks like in the future. We're going to continue to adapt all of our courses, our content, the way we present things at our conferences in partnership with others. And it's just a, a real testament to this field that so many people have already stepped up in partnership with us. And I think there's lots of opportunity ahead to do more. I, I love that. And, you know, kind of an open question to everybody. Is it is it just me or does it seem like this is a real thing with collaborations at the highest level actually coming together and happening? Like going to IEDC and having a discussion about MBIA. That never would have happened five years ago. Um, even the formulation of EVLN and Andy, the work that you are doing builds on uh, a lot of conversations and relationships that have been forged over the last 10 years plus. Um, is that something that you all see being continuing and happening potentially, hopefully more frequently? It sounds like Nathan, you you fully intend for that to be the case. Well, we certainly do. Uh, we're seeing it, we're hearing it most importantly. I think the hearing part and seeing it, both of those things together are really critical. And if you were at the IEC annual conference in Denver in September, you would have seen that entrepreneurship was in every one of our plenary sessions. Absolutely. We had specific track on entrepreneurship. That is a, a historic thing for us as an organization, but it's really a representation of the field and the feedback that we heard from members and others on the ground. And so it's not just us at the national or international level of collaborating, it's happening on the ground in communities, which I think is the most critical aspect. I just yeah, build on I'll, that. For, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say see. that, um, you know, I just wanted to commend uh, Nathan for his his leadership on this. And um, as I'm sure Andy will probably share, um, we had a chance to uh, participate um, in a significant way in, in the recent conference for IEDC in, in Denver. Um, and, and that was just a really, really powerful set of uh, conversations. And um, Rob, you had mentioned earlier about the most recent collaboration between MBIA and SourceLink for our uh, eBuilders forum, and I think that um, I think these collaborations are going to to continue for a couple of reasons. One, I think that um, you know we're definitely seeing many of the critical stakeholders in this work are um, expressing their their preference for more collaboration in the field. Um, you look at um, what many of the philanthropic uh, funders are um, emphasizing, um, and they're looking at uh, funding collaborative, collaborative impact models. Um, you look at what's going on in the government sector and some of the grant proposals that are that are um, coming up. In all of the most of those are requiring some type of uh, collaboration within your ecosystem in order to uh, be competitive. Um, and then the other thing, the last thing I'll say on it is, is that what's really great and rewarding is when we, um, when we lead, lean forward with or lean into uh, collaboration and lean forward with trust. Um, I think it's just kind of a vicious circle where when we have positive experience and pos positive vibes from those, those experiences. It just makes the collaboration in the future so much easier. We'll build on that uh, and just say uh, ecosystem building leadership or EBLN, the group that I am 
recently uh, uh, been appointed the direct, executive director of it, is really emerging out of eight years of work that started with the Kaufman Foundation, the Egypt summits in 2017. Those events and the work that Kaufman uh, orchestrated doesn't exist without SourceLink, MBIA, IADC. Uh, a lot of other friends. I see Don Mackey's on this call, Don Mackey, uh -huh. uh, who is the godfather of ecosystem building uh, doing this uh, work. It doesn't exist with that collaboration. And then literally IED, the, or sorry, excuse me, literally EBLN, acronym soup, doesn't exist, the organization I'm leading, without contributions of both money and staff time uh, from SourceLink and, and Nathan's group and Charles's group and Rob's group and Maria's group. It, it just does, literally doesn't exist. It is built on collaborative structures and a collaborative co-design process. And I uh, can, if I whiteboarded it out, you would be amazed at how many touch points there are. But the reason that this is important, this is the reason why it's not just because it feels good and it sounds good to say we collaborate, but the local work, the actual people on the ground in Wichita and Fresno and Tampa, which are a lot of people on this call, who are trying to create and foster collaborative networks to sort of support entrepreneurs uh, uh, have, to, have to be collaborative. It's, it's essential. And what I've learned in my eight years of being more at the national, actually nine years being at the national level, is that we if we don't model that at the national level, if we're siloed and we're fighting with each other over resources, that culture actually propagates down, mm. right? And so, so example is even... You know, Charles's group is primarily, not entirely, but primarily entrepreneurial support organizations. IDC Nathan's group is primarily people who work in traditional economic development. There's a lot of gray in the middle of that now, but let's just say 10 years ago, that was definitely the case. There are places that I visit where there is still almost like step sibling fighting going on between the entrepreneurial support organizations and the economic developers about who owns, quote unquote, entrepreneurship in their town. At the end of the day, that is really bad for our primary target audience, which is the entrepreneurs. If the entrepreneurs can't figure out who they're supposed to be talking to or getting sent all in circular directions, they're not gonna be able to start and grow their businesses. And so what I love about the work of the folks on this panel and other people who I, we can make this panel even bigger with folks that are here, is that collaborative culture that we've tried to develop both from the bottom up and the top down in this emerging field. And I think it's, it, our, our hope is that if, if these big national organizations uh, can model that uh, uh, and also learn from the folks doing that in local communities. It's really the central practice of entrepreneurial-led economic development and ecosystem building is creating the environment in which that, that collaborative and entrepreneurial-minded uh, environment exists to help people start and grow businesses. Excellent. I would like, so there was um, something shared that I definitely want to talk about because I think it'll be very interesting to a lot of the attendees. Um, and that was a comment, Charles, you raised about um, federal funding. And it has been very interesting to watch programs like the Community Navigator Pilot Program. Um, the, the other ones now where they, they literally are trying to take a collective impact model or a shared model, funds are being distributed. Um, do any one of you want to talk a little bit about what we're seeing and what we see kind of ha going forward? And, and the other piece I would I would add, I know three of you, I, I'm Charles, I, I don't know if you've gone after one of these or not, but I know there are three of the panelists. Most of us, I think, have actually gotten funds from these very programs to deliver very big um, projects. And so how I would love to hear how you approach going after those federal grants when they're shaped in that way. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Um, so um, I'll, st I'll start off. I mean, I would say that, um, you know, I was thinking about some of the success stories around um, collaboration and ecosystem building at regional or uh, at the regional level and the role that the government's playing. And, and one of the programs that I'll mention is the uh, SBA growth accelerator fund competition, mm -hmm. um, which I think is pretty interesting. So it's, it's probably, it's not as large as maybe the, what, what I think some of the other panelists will start talking about in terms of maybe like the NSF engines or the Build Back Better, but it's, it's, it's uh, while it's not as large, it's, I think it's pretty innovative. And it's really kind of totally focused on providing flexible funding for organizations to pursue in uh, partnership discussions. And what's interesting about some of the larger grants 
is that um, if you are um, putting together your grant proposal and looking to identify who can we partner with, you're too late. <laughs> yeah. um, for many of these grants, you need to have been working in your ecosystem and partnering with folks for you know at least six months or a year um, in order to be positioned to respond to the, those grant proposals. What's interesting about the Growth Accelerator Fund competition is it provides resources for you to actually explore, or initiate, or catalyze those partnerships. And so I think that, that that's a pretty innovative uh, government program that um, I'll, I'll mention, and you know we we hope it it continues. I can. Uh, one of the things that I think is important is when when you do these bigger federal grants or just about any grant, I think one of the things that we look at is if this grant gets turned down, does the person reviewing it feel like they've turned down the entire community? Because it seems to me that it'd be really much harder to make the decision if they felt like they were turning down the entire community than if they were turning down one organization. And so we try to really think about that as we put our grants together um, to make sure that we're reaching out to a big enough swath of the community so that anybody who turns this down is going to feel like, wow, they've really turned down the whole community. I'll add a couple of thoughts on top of these, on these grants. So let's do a quiz first, just to make this fun and interactive uh, since it's a Zoom thing. Um, how much money is the federal government going to distribute this year or this decade for entrepreneurial-led economic development? And ecosystem innovation ecosystem building. So, how much money is the federal government? So, your options are uh, three hundred million, six billion, or thirteen billion. Three hundred million, six billion, or thirteen billion. Can I wreck your chat, Rob, and just say everybody put their guests in the chat? Yeah, have at it. Yeah. Okay, three hundred million, six billion, thirteen billion. Hey, be quick. I don't know. That's a good answer. Thanks for being straight. Okay, we're all over the board. The actual answer, because this game show is, is only has a limited amount of time, the actual answer based on uh, the very scientific study of the back of a napkin and Andy sitting at a conference looking up the top 10 programs, $13 billion. $13 billion towards economic, entrepreneurial focus economic development. And it's at least $13 billion because there's a bunch of programs that are like named funny that I don't remember, but that includes NSF Engines, the Build Back Better, the Tech Hubs, uh, the Build to Scale. And that's that's in this decade that we are currently in. If you had told me eight years ago there was going to be a hundred million dollars for ecosystem building in the federal government, I said, I don't believe you. And so if the question eight to ten years ago, or the first ESHIP summit, 2007 is, is entrepreneurship economic development? Uh, the federal government has very clearly answered that network-based, equity-centered, innovation, entrepreneurship, coalition-led ecosystem building in places outside of the traditional hubs is the primary way the United States of America does economic development, particularly in its global competition with China and other countries. So that's one huge change that has happened. And we're still making sense of all of these grants. I think uh, Maria's point is well put. Um, the, uh, and I will add on top of that, the advantage of going after these economic development or these large federal grants sometimes isn't always the grant itself. I always say, you know, if, if collaboration is at the center of ecosystem building and entrepreneurial economic development, you don't buy, you don't build trust and collaboration by having a meeting about building trust and collaboration. So if you find yourself in a meeting talking about how we're going to collaborate and build trust, just cancel the meeting because I'm telling you it's not going to work. It's going to be a waste of a meeting. You build trust and collaboration by doing something together. I don't actually care what the something is as long as everybody agrees that's the thing they want to do. So it could be that we're going to organize a monthly bowling activity and we're going to take all the leaders of our entrepreneur support organizations and ecosystem leaders bowling that's on one end you could also say hey we're going to get together every other week hang out at the bowling alley and put together a proposal for an nsf engine uh, discovery phase one grant um, but through the act of writing those collaborative proposals and as charles says you can't even apply unless you apply with a, a coalition uh, that's the opportunity to build that requisite uh, trust and collaboration or to continue to build it in your ecosystem. And then to the point made earlier, even if you don't get it, you've now built that coalition and you have some 
folks who said I got some local matching funds. So don't miss out on uh, these opportunities as a tool uh, for those doing this type of work in your communities. There's a lot of money coming from federal government. Obviously, uh, we'll see what happens in the new administration, uh, but a lot of those are built into congressional legislation. So I don't think they're going anywhere fast. I, I just want to add two quick pieces to tie tie in with what everyone just, just talked about. And that is these federal opportunities, when they're released, you typically have like 30 to 45 days to respond. That's and so to Charles's point, you have to have those relationships and that trust built way in advance of these opportunities. Mm -hmm. I'll just give you an example. We launched a new program called the Economic Recovery Corps, which again was funded through some of these programs. It's not exclusive to entrepreneurship, but a lot of the fellows in this program are focused on entrepreneurship, but economic development. Mm -hmm. And it was a 45 day window to apply for it. Uh, and we we had six partners that were named in our proposal as a part of that. And someone asked me, you know, how did you get those partners? And I said, because I had deep relationships with each of those partners. In fact, we had talked to nine partners about that opportunity. And so when I called them, when the opportunity came out, I said, I don't know what what this is going to be like. I don't know what role you can or cannot play, but I want you to be a part of it. And all within three days said, yes, we're going to do that. And we figured it out in a 45 day window to put this program together. The other piece of this, though, is it can't just be about supporting your organization and the work you're trying to do. You've got to be showing up at the tables and conversations that others are hosting and, and you know, make sure they know that they feel valued and that they're a part of this. And I'll, I'll just give an example from my past with Andy. I helped to start a program called Rural Rise, which is a focus on rural entrepreneurship. And Coffin Foundation was obviously the, the biggest game in town around entrepreneurship. But, you know, and Andy will tell you at that point in time, they weren't really engaged in rural conversations as much. And so we, I went to Andy and I said, Andy, we're going to host this and you need to be there. And if you tell me you can't, it's perfectly fine. We're going to go host it anyways, but we really do need your expertise to be at the table with us in planning this and putting it together. And almost immediately, Andy said, yes, we're going to be there, whatever that means. And so it is about making sure you're reaching out and building those relationships but also making sure that you're amplifying and showcasing the priorities of other organizations and other partners in that work. And I, I, if I can add to that, to a person, everyone on this panel does that. I cannot believe the number of times that we've called on one another and said, can you do this? Can you help out with this? Can you provide expertise on this? And to a person, every one of you rise to that, to that every single time. And I think that that's, that's worth expressing, and I just want to share that. So uh, my gratitude to each of you, because you exemplify and do that day in and day out. Andy, I see you just came off mute. Did you? Yeah. So uh, this has been a great panel. Uh, I just to be uh, interesting, uh, because um, of, uh, just to not keep it as uh -oh. just rainbows and butterflies and marshmallows. Why is marshmallows in that list? Uh, <laughs> rainbows and butterflies. <laughs> is that let's talk a little bit about with these federal grants, one of the challenges that we're facing is the federal government and, and thank you, Congress and everybody who's built those programs, uh, especially with the COVID pandemic and everything that's come there uh, and after that, built these programs and, and it felt to much of an extent at the beginning, we're shoveling money out so fast, as fast as they could, but mm -hmm. they have also not been super clear about what exactly they're hoping everyone does, it creates other than equity-centered innovation and entrepreneurship. And so one of the challenges we face in this field right now is that economic or entrepreneurship-led economic development and ecosystem building and entrepreneurial innovation ecosystem have, been, have become more central to these conversations. But everyone who's doing this is still an early adopter of this practice. There is not an easy playbook. I mean, the best thing I point people to who are new is actually Marie and Kate's book. I say, go read that. But you can't cover it all in a 120 page or it's even easier to read it's like a 110 page book it's a great framework but it's not the recipe and so one of the challenges that we face uh, uh for those doing the local work and for national organizations like ours is to continue to codify and develop practices processes metrics training certification it's what i refer to as the field and also you know really recognizing that ecosystem building is an emerging field and a profession that fits in uh, economic development, community development, workforce development. But what are we, or what do you all see as what's needed urgently to help develop uh, uh, support for people doing ecosystems and entrepreneurial economic development? What do we need to build next to really help people on the ground doing this work? You know, we've been um, looking at 
what do entrepreneurial support organizations need as well as what do our entrepreneurs need? And actually, we just finished um, taking a look at the KC ecosystem to find out what what, are our, what do we need? And interestingly enough, we did this process back in about 2011 as well. And we found a lot of the same things. We were just in a different place in the journey. And so I think that that's an interesting concept to think about as well as where, where are you in the journey? And we found, you know, the typical things that you would find, we need more money for entrepreneurs and we need additional um, corporate engagement. We need to tell our story better about what we do in entrepreneurship. And there's, there are seven things that we talk about. We also need to open doors, and remove barriers so that anybody can be an entrepreneur that wants to be. So we, we have that. But one of the other things that came out of that was we need more capacity in our entrepreneurial support organizations. And we started asking the entrepreneurial support organizations what it is that, that they needed um, for support. And interestingly, um, they also want to know about entrepreneurial-led economic development. They'd really like to understand the trends and the things that are happening um, there. They also um, really just want to know how to run their organizations a little bit better, um, how to, to manage those things. They um, also would like to know, and this is pretty basic, how to navigate their own entrepreneurial ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be different in every in every community. So that I think that's important. And they want to know the basics of how do I write a grant? How do I find grant um, opportunities? And so there, there's kind of a stack of things that we're finding that the support organizations are looking for. The other thing that... Um, we found is that getting the philanthropic community to understand the power of entrepreneurship is also a big story that needs to be told right now. And we're starting to do things like have small dinners with um, entrepreneurial support organizations and some of our um, our uh, philanthropists around here just to talk about the power of entrepreneurship. So there are just some some things that are happening and this is all collected, right? We, we're doing all of this um, together. We actually defined a vision a statement for Kansas City around entrepreneurship as well, collectively amongst um, about 200 organizations. So that, was, that those are the things that we're working on right now. And again, um, it's a journey and we are in a different place in our journey than we were in 2010. And we look forward to what can happen over the next 10 years as we as we move these things forward. I would just add to what Maria said and that this is, we're at the very start of the journey, that this is an, an evolution, maybe even a revolution in the way that we're thinking about the connectivity that ha that is existing between what some folks would call traditional economic development and ecosystem building. And I think the important piece to that is, is remembering that there are going to be days that are hard and that we're not seeing the progress that we want to see. And that we can lean on one another in those times uh, to raise one another up. The other piece that I think is really critical is, is the messaging that we use on this. You know, Andy, at the at the eShip summits, we talked a lot about kind of the definitions of what this is and how do we talk about it. And whether it's economic development, whether it's ecosystem building, whether it's entrepreneurship-led economic development, the storytelling aspect of this work is so critical and oftentimes the most overlooked item of this work. And so we need to do a better job collectively of showcasing and highlighting the stories of what is happening on the ground, what it means to communities, what the results are to communities, and most importantly, what it means to the people that are being impacted by this, both the entrepreneurs, but also those in the community that are impacted by the opportunities to have jobs through through these startups, uh, or even you know the, the impact that these companies are having in community. So I, I would just challenge all of us to make sure that the storytelling aspect stays at the front of our minds. You know, another uh, couple of pieces of info that we picked up as, as well, and you mentioned this a little bit too, is um, we saw much more um, emphasis on talent for these organizations this time around than we did before. And I think we're hearing that across the board, right? Who, where is the talent to, to run our companies and, um, and keep them, moving. So I, th I think that was another important piece. And the other piece that actually came up much higher than we saw before was moving research uh, from lab to market. And I think some of that is back to where the federal government is right now on trying to um, uh, build some of our manufacturing processes 
back and, you know, when we start talking about tech hubs and engines and all of these things, I think there's a more, there's been more of an emphasis on that as well. So getting that translation done seems to be of high importance now. And we didn't hear that as much 10 years ago. Sorry to, to hog, hog this, but the other thing, being the representative, obviously Charles as well, of international, it's also important for us to recognize that this is happening across the world. Whether I'm in Ecuador or Australia or here in the United States, these conversations are happening. And so where we can learn from one another, lift, lift one another up. I know Andrew Button's here from Canada. We've got a representative from Kenya. Obviously, this is Global Entrepreneurship Week. And so making sure that we recognize and lift up what, what's happening across the world and take those learnings and apply those is really critical as well. I think it's also great that there's going to be a mini um, Eco Builders Conference at the MBIA, MBIA, MBIA conference that's going to be in April. I had an earlier meeting with one of our um, corporate partners, Bank of America, and there were 10 people on the call. And, and I shared that with them because of what somebody said earlier about making sure that our corporate partners are at the table. And they were like, send us that information. We want to send some people to that conference. So I think that that's an opportunity for all of us to do that um, and then have these continuing discussions. Thank you for sharing. Also, I would also add uh, just to, and I don't know Cecilia or other folks from Global Entrepreneurship Network are here, but given that it's Global Entrepreneurship Week, uh, every year, the Global Entrepreneurship Network hosts the Global Entrepreneurship Congress. It's the largest gathering of people who care about entrepreneurs and ecosystems from around the world. Uh, I've been very fortunate uh, to be able to go to the last three or four. It was like uh, in reverse order. It was Australia, Australia, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Turkey, South Africa. And it goes back actually to originally starting in Kansas City uh, almost 12 years ago. Uh, but that is the largest gathering of people who care about entrepreneurs and ecosystems in the world. And for the first time in almost 14 years, it is coming to back to the United States and will be hosted in Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, in uh, June of 2025. I will tell you, having gone, I thought, and I'll be super honest, the first time I went, I thought, oh, it's going to be a bunch of government ministers from all over the world. And I'm a grassroots dude who, who doesn't know how to talk government. So I don't know if I should go. But really, it's the folks who are on this call or members of the network of the folks on the panel. Uh, from all over the world, from countries you didn't even know there was a country named that, and they're talking about entrepreneurship. And I went the first time also as an American with a chip on my shoulder, but how I was going to tell everyone about ecosystem building. And boy, did I learn a lot uh, from the folks in Vietnam, Madagascar, uh, uh, Argentina, Chile. So please, if you're not doing anything in early June, please join us in, in um, Indiana for the Global Entrepreneurship Congress. I believe that's open right now. There is also an ambassadors program uh, that G Global Entrepreneurship Network is doing. If you want to help recruit people from your state or your community, you can sort of get yourself a free pass. So check it out. Uh, at, uh, I think it's genglobal.org. It is. Oh, nice. um, it is, I would add, it is amazing the um, what's happening internationally when it comes to ecosystem building and, and them actually using the word ecosystem building. Um, I saw that trend happening almost five years ago. We monitor all the, all the keywords in our industry. And I'd say half of them that were coming in when we were getting our, our alerts uh, were in other places, other places around the world, people doing this work. So it's very exciting. Um, all right, well, while we're all sharing, I know that all of you also have a lot of um, expertise, knowledge and events. And so if you wanna just quickly share what you've got your eye on this coming year, um, and I'll try to put in links where appropriate as well. But Nathan, I know you've got an annual conference. Charles, I know you've got your annual conference. Um, other events that you should be aware of, uh, who would like to kind of share what they're, they're keeping their eye on in terms of events or happenings this coming year in addition to what we've already covered? Or maybe we already covered it and we can move on. Well, um, Rob, <laughs> I'll... Um... I'll, I'll mention something that'll maybe intersect with some comments that may have been, been made by a couple of the panelists. Um, so I think in this work is really important for us. Uh, Nathan was talking about the storytelling, right? Mm -hmm. um, and to uh, prop up um, examples of excellence and opportunities to celebrate success. So in connection with our um, conferences coming up in April, which is going to be in Philadelphia, I think it's the 6th through the 9th. 
of uh, April. Um, every year we um, pull out a call for uh, applications for excellence and entrepreneurial support. Um, we evaluate excellence across nine uh, categories. And so that's something that uh, we, we, I'm always excited about because not only to celebrate, but then really use it as a, a mechanism to share and transfer best practices. Um, so um, for those of you who um, will we'll provide some information to um, sign up for um, the call for applications and, and would love to have your, your uh, input in that. Excellent. And Nathan, you have some awards programs as well. Yeah, I was going to highlight two different things. In 2025, IDC is hosting its first ever Rural Economic Development Summit, uh, June 23rd to 25th. I think this is one conversation that we just don't talk enough about is, is what does rural entrepreneurship look like and, and what, does it, what does it mean to these communities? Um, so there's an opportunity there to participate. We have our annual conference, which will be held in Detroit, Michigan, this coming September. Uh, we also have an awards program that goes alongside that where we highlight really great best practices and a whole host of, of, of opportunities. And so happy to send that out to this group and make sure that you're aware of it. Anyone is, is allowed and eligible to apply uh, or nominate themselves for an award. And it's a great opportunity to be highlighted, not just in the entrepreneurship ecosystem building world, but the, the broader economic development world as well. And Sam Rich Wheeler from Philadelphia, the Business Center for Entrepreneurship and Social Enterprise and new board member. On December 13th, we have our annual Best Practices in Action Awards ceremony. And uh, we try to make it an educational experience as well. We have a component called How I Built This. Um, and this year, we are going to have three um, Black male doctors that talk about how they built their businesses all in different stages of you know their business life cycle. Uh, so that's going to be at Acadia University, December 13th from 8.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. And I'll put the details in the chat and also send it out to whoever the key person is who's emailing the group. And we also use that time to recognize the businesses, both adult and youth businesses that we've had the opportunity to work with. Very good. Thanks, Pam. All right. Well, I know we only have... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Andy. Well, I'm going to shout out a couple of people who are not here represented on the panel who have national conferences. I'm going to leave someone out. Don't be mad. I did it quick. But there's three. Uh, there's a short term, medium term and long term. Uh, the SSTI has their conference uh, uh, actually like in three weeks. Uh, they're really around tech based uh, economic development. They have all track on ecosystem building and a lot of entrepreneurship and innovation stuff. They also provide technical support for a lot of those federal grants. So you can learn about those. Uh, Rural Rise is all in the chat. Rural Rise. Uh, Nathan is a co-founder of Rural Rise uh, with Tina and Joe. Uh, this is a uh, national grassroots network of people doing ecosystem building in rural communities. Um, and so you can learn more about Rural Rise. All their events are virtual, at least monthly. Hang out with them. And then the Startup Champions Network, which is an ecosystem building peer-to-peer -peer network, or really probably the first uh, group that thought of ecosystem building as a professional association. They announced their next conference is going to be in Las Vegas in the spring and Augusta, Georgia in the fall. And that's those are all national conferences. So you can go to them, but also it's helpful sometimes if they're in your neighborhood. So there's more, but I'm going to stop there. That's great. Thank you, Andy. All right, so we have two minutes. I'm going to open um, up to the panelists uh, to share any takeaways or um, wrap up thoughts if you would like. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and uh, thank everyone for coming. But uh, do you have any parting words or things that you would like to share? Uh, just a, a thank you to all the all the folks on the call for all they're doing on the ground and an, and an open invitation both to provide feedback to us but also to continue to participate yes. alongside us and helping to continue to drive the the entrepreneurship led economic development work content uh, and stories so please uh, please engage with us and Mo Collins who is also on this call on my team uh, is leading that workforce and obviously one of the, the the original founders of this work so thank you to everyone for for all the work you're doing. Thanks, Nathan. Maria, you want to go next? Sure. Um, if you haven't gotten started yet, um, talk to Rob. He'll help you get started <laughs> with assessing, uh, assessing some things, but also in, enjoy Global Entrepreneurship Week. Uh, find a way to continue to be involved in that over the next um, few days. It really is one of the most exciting celebrations of entrepreneurship. And to realize that we're doing it with so many different countries at the same time 
is unbelievable. So enjoy that moment, moment in time for the next couple of days. Thank you. Andy Charles. Do either of you like to go? Oh, I'll go. Um, go ahead. Yeah. So um, I just like to thank the um, uh, participants for the, for their time. Um, and just extend, uh, as Nathan had mentioned, the, the invitation. If there's any way that um, MBIA and our community can help your work, uh, please feel free to reach out. And uh, we'd, we'd love to be able to amplify your impacts. Thanks, I always say I always say that the secret, if you boil down ecosystem building to its simplest, the secret sauce, the one thing is everybody just needs to be friends. Because what do you do for your friends? You help each other, you support them, you cheer them on. When they're down, you help them up. When they need something, you, you lend them a hand. And I would like to thank uh, Maria, Charles, Nathan, Rob. Uh, we've been working on this for a long time. And, and it really does uh, feel like we're not just doing this as a professional colleagues, but as friends. And I appreciate the opportunity and the invitation to be here, Maria and Rob and the team at SourceLink. The one piece of advice or the one thing I would sort of let people leave with, I see Don's on here, you know, the godfather of rural ecosystem building, Mo Collins, Maria's here, who literally wrote the book on it. There have been folks that have been working on in this space for a long time, and we're all sort of standing on the shoulder, their shoulders and the shoulders of giants. But if you're doing this work, especially if you're new to it, recognize we're still in the phase of a social innovation. We are inventing a new way to do things. And if you don't know, it doesn't feel like you know what you're doing or you're making it up, it's because we're all making it up. But if we make it up together, if we develop this, uh, the processes and the structures and the metrics and the funding models, it is going to be so much easier than each of us trying to make it up in our little community, our local communities, our own little silos. So continue to connect with each other and other folks and things uh, through these networks that we've learned about today or, or, or relearned about. Um, it only works, uh, you can, not one organization or individual can build an ecosystem it takes all of us to do this work together and just appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this community and this growing community and the work that everyone's doing, especially those of you doing on the local ground, which is the real hard work of directly helping entrepreneurs through building better environments for them. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Well, I want to thank, um, sincerely thank Maria, Nathan, Charles, Andy. Thank you for sharing your wisdom, your time with everyone today. I really do genuinely look forward to this coming year. I think we have a lot of uh, promising opportunities to further our collaborations and to help more entrepreneurs and more uh, um, small business owners get started and to grow. And I wanna thank everybody as well who joined today and provided your time uh, to, to join us as part of our Global Entrepreneurship Week. Um, have a great rest of the week. And cheers to the coming 2025 and all of the great things that are yet to come next year. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.